What's up guys, Landon Rhodes with Spark to Fire here, and today we're doing a Spark to Fire a little bit different. We're in Omaha, Nebraska, and we're here to interview Dusty Davidson and Rick Knudsen from Flywheel. I'm really excited about this. We're outside of this beautiful refurbished brick building. I think about office goals for Grindstone someday, and this place is literally like a dream to walk into, so let's go check it out. What's up guys, welcome back to another episode of Spark to Fire. I'm your host, Landon Rhodes, and today we've got the founders of Flywheel. Thanks for coming on the show today, guys. Thanks for Thanks having for us, Landon. Yeah, this is, this is awesome. So Flywheel was listed as one of the fastest growing companies in Nebraska. You guys are known for your phenomenal culture, and uh, I just want to give you guys a second to introduce yourselves uh, before we kind of set the frame here for uh, what's going on today. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, my name is Dusty Davidson, uh, co-founder uh, and uh, I guess now former CEO of Flywheel, yeah. uh, as uh, we we sold and have moved on, but uh, uh, you know started uh, Flywheel with uh, another gentleman and my partner Rick here, uh, you know almost nine years ago. Uh, so yeah, so Rick Knudsen and um, co-founder Flywheel at Flywheel, I kind of headed up product uh, over many years at the company, and before that uh, worked for a previous company with Dusty and built websites and. Uh, but now, previously at Flywheel as well, it's weird so. to say. It is weird to say. It's hard to say. But yeah, so. yeah. You you spend your you know you spend a significant amount of your life building something, and then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, we we used to do that. Now now we're doing something new, which we will talk about uh, at the end of the episode. But cool. uh, you know, to get these started, uh, the best way to do it is to understand the origin story. So I'd love to know um, just at the very beginning, like what were you guys like as kids? You know, because a lot of a lot of that stuff comes out early. You know, you're were you a troublemaker? You guys, either of you, troublemakers as kids? I don't, I don't think so. I was a nerd. So I, I like, I think I was a, you know, I always knew that like computer software was the thing that I wanted. You know, the, the internet was not even a thing when I was a kid, but you know, it was starting to come up and you sort of taught myself programming and always knew that that was the thing. Never was entrepreneurial though, uh, but always, always a nerd, you know, video games and computer programming. Very, very similar. Yeah. It's, I was not, uh, I was not in trouble. Yeah. I was definitely a good kid. I was, but I, but I do remember I was um, I was always entrepreneurial, honestly, and and I did like Dusty. I mean, the internet was the dawning of the internet was you know my childhood, so I was always online learning things. And um, early age got really kind of obsessed with the idea of building things, you know. And, and, and in a lot of ways, I was um, as a kid in, in in high school. I remember actually never really having a real job. You know, I was building websites and teaching myself how to code. And this is um, in high school. This is high school. Yeah. So okay. Uh, so <laughs> love it. So yeah. So I, I you know I, I don't know. There's always an itch in there, and and of course went on you know to to college to continue to learn how to to program and all that. So I was I was always online, always learning. Uh, definitely had a spark early on um, as an entrepreneur. But uh, you know I think that a lot of that kind of like paves the way in the future. And you know. It's it's uh it's kind of fun to think back actually, but yeah. Yeah. How did you two get to know each other? Uh, well, I was running a like a web dev shop called Brightmix, and uh, we were looking for interns. And uh, actually, I think Rick reached out just blindly and said like, yeah. "Hey, you guys look like you're doing cool stuff. Like, 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 can I work for you?" I, oh, guess? Yeah, I, I remember writing the email. Actually, <laughs> I, I remember I was sitting. Uh, in the basement of uh, my my now wife's uh, family's house, you know, the gr girlfriend at the time, and I was crafting the email saying, "I got, I want to find an interesting job in Omaha." Dusty was doing interesting things with Bright Mix, the agency at the time, and uh, I wrote I wrote two emails to the two companies I wanted to work with, and he responded first, you know. So it's kind of funny because it's uh, it's it's little things like that, you know, you know change change your life. And I, I remember. Uh, uh, I get an email back and it was pretty exciting. But that's how we first met is I worked uh, at Dusty's first first company. Yeah. Gotcha. So you had an agency, web dev shop. Did you guys do anything outside of uh, web dev or just straight on that? It was mostly, you know, on, honestly, we did mostly like application development work, um, sort of back end stuff mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of agencies. And so it was at a time when a lot of agencies didn't have in-house dev mm. 
war, uh, help. And so we were kind of their outsourced party in that way, whether that was applications or ultimately websites uh, and kind of the, you know, the backbone of that. And that's, you know, honestly, that's where we kind of got into using WordPress. WordPress was pretty early on then, but we, we kind of uh, sort of glommed onto it as, as the sort of tool of choice that we built on. And, uh, you know, so we did a lot of work. And it's also how we met a lot of uh, agency friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a lot of the design shops and agencies in, in, in and around Omaha and Lincoln, um, you know, we're still good friends with to this day, mm -hmm. um, back from those, like doing work with them in the early days. And, and ultimately, I think that's what led us, um, you know, kind of down this path of a flywheel because you know it is, it is you know ultimately scratching our own itch mm -hmm. in the WordPress space, and so um, you know that was you know kind of the early early bright mix days, kind of the, the the catalyst for a lot of that. Yeah, and so anybody that's built a website on WordPress knows that there's just a lot of different pieces, a lot of moving pieces to building a great website and there's a wrong way to do it. There's several wrong ways to do it. And there's a few right ways to do it, especially when it comes to managed hosting. I mean, specifically, uh, being able to build websites. I know I've done things the wrong way a couple of times, quite a few times in terms of like setting up the hosting, making sure that the site's running as fast as it's supposed to run. I mean, there's just a lot of moving parts in the background. You get creative people. They're like, I can design a website. Like I'll just use Wix or I'll just use WordPress. But they then you run like a Google speed test on it and you're like, we have a 15% rating, <laughs> you know, like, and, yeah, or it gets hacked. Or it's it's hacked. Yeah. Yeah. They go into the, like, the back end of the code and then they take it over. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, different risks associated with that. And you, you mentioned that you were scratching your own itch when you were getting started with it. So what was, uh, what was kind of that jumping off moment of that spark to fire moment with flywheel? Well, like Rick tell it's sort of like the actual idea, but once we, uh, once we, you know, I think the, the general pain point is that Brightmix, you know, we would, we would, you know, we'd charge, Twenty thousand dollars to build a website, and then you'd put it on two dollar a month hosting, <laughs> and and it would get hacked. So you'd have a an attorney or some business that would pay a ton of money for a beautiful website, and and the the quality of the where it lived didn't sort of match the quality of the work that that we had put into it, um, and we thought that that was incongruent. And um, and honestly, it just it also was. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of hosting companies in the world and the, the, the majority of them are not very good. And I think that that, you know, that creates a, an opportunity, I think, in a, in a, in a cool way. Yeah, so it, it, there is actually like this great intersection of what, you know, Dusty and the agency that he was building was doing and working with agencies in town. And I had moved on to um, be a freelance web designer. The, the first and only job I ever held, I think, was working for Dusty a little bit at Brightmix. And uh, I went on to kind of was like, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to build websites. It's what I had known, you know, it, at that point my entire life. And um, I, w I got connected with someone out in New York, a now friend of ours, early customer of Flywheel, actually. And she was a designer, a creative, um, uh, like an art director out there. And she was building websites for architecture firms in New York. So the budgets were really big. I was this kid in Omaha, Nebraska with these amazing projects. And, um, you know, I started doing lots of projects for her. And I, and I remember this, this one day I got an email from her and she said, Hey, I want to co-write this proposal for this new project. It was, it's like $40,000, you know, you're gonna split the money for this project. And I'm like, $20,000 to build a WordPress site. This is, I'm 22 years old. This Game is insane. <laughs> uh, but I was actually kind of terrified because I had launched a number of sites at that point that had gotten hacked and I was building on WordPress and I was like, I can't build this site and, and see it get hacked again. Um, and of course our other co-founder, Tony was working uh, with, with Dusty at the time too, and much more technical. He's kind of the technical brains behind mm -hmm. Flywheel called him that day and said, Hey, like I'll split this money with you if you just make sure this site does not get hacked. Like build the <laughs> server that is like indestructible. I don't understand how to do it. Um, and we knew at that moment that, you know, this problem was bigger than me. You know, this was like you said, you know, these creatives in the world that have access to these tools that allow them to create, but then you have to also be technical enough to make sure that long-term the site's viable online. It doesn't get hacked. It's fast. And um, so in that moment, I was like, this is kind of interesting. I think that maybe we can solve this problem for people like myself and like Dusty and the agencies we were working with. Uh, so Tony and I called Dusty and said, hey, dude, like, we don't know anything about companies. <laughs> My, will you be the CEO? You know, and, and of course, you know, with what Dusty had been doing in the past with the connections to agencies, we've seen these problems many times with some of the websites we'd build with the agencies. And, and all of that kind of coming together was the genesis of, you know, what made Flywheel interesting. Yeah just taking that burden off of the creatives of the agencies saying like, we got you. 
yeah. it's going to be safe with us. Yeah. And, and that, that does give a lot of confidence when you're building a site, you want it to be, you want it to be safe. You want it to be fast. And, uh, that obviously creates a huge market. So what, in the early stages, you know, when, when people were choosing say between, you know, you have your domain registrar and then you have your actual hosting managed hosting companies, were people making like thinking that you were GoDaddy or were they confusing you? Was there a lot of confusion in the beginning? They're like, why would I do that when I could, you know, cause people just don't know. So I'm just curious, like, did you run into a lot of those issues at the beginning? Yeah, I think that we, we always wanted the brand to, to set itself apart from other players in the market. In fact, we, we, we talk a lot, a lot about humanizing hosting in the time when all the, uh, almost all the other hosting companies in the world had pictures of servers on the homepage or very technical. <laughs> um, you know, I think we were, we were trying to build a human brand and a beautiful brand um, because we were, we were selling and working with creatives and with designers and, and in, an, in an effect that we set ourselves apart in that industry and I think really resonated with the people who, who were the ones building the websites. Yeah. And so um, I don't think it was confusion as much as in a lot of cases, just relief that yeah. like, hey, here's someone like me who, uh, here's a company that, that kind of like feels like I do if I'm a designer or a creative. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and, you know, we saw, you know, we got a lot of early traction from people who were, you know, these are people who, are non-technical who don't or who don't want to deal with that stuff no. and and so um and and almost everywhere else in the world uh, at that point all the competitors were i mean still at that it, 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 like super comp super technical super confusing yeah su super like you have to tinker with stuff and it's a, it's we really knew the customer, you yeah. know, because right. we were the customer we, we worked like, with them. They were just like us. They right. were just like <laughs> us, you know. So I actually remember one of the earliest websites we built for Flywheel, the marketing site, was we had this little section that said, like, you know, we heart designers. You know, this little title and underneath it was Laura Mipsum text, which for anyone that's listening who's, Fluff that. who's a designer, like, knows that that's filler <laughs> text for, like, mocking things up. And the number of times we'd get an email from someone who'd be like, hey, your website's broke. You guys forgot to put copy in here. And we'd be like, huh. You're not a customer. Got it. You know, and, and, uh, then <laughs> we all customers would email yeah, like designers email would be like, "That's hilarious." Yes. And we're so, like, yeah. "Okay." Like, so I think that, like that, a lot of it was, you know, like Dusty said, you, if you found the right customer because you knew them so well, it was this like sense of relief, like oh, you guys get it. This is this is yeah. interesting, you know, and um, and that was that was I think I think a testament to like that that was an underserved kind of market and type of customer. So I was watching the the documentary about Blockbuster. And I was watching, uh, also listened to a podcast uh, from the founder of Netflix. And he talked about iteration. So you're a product guy. At the beginning, basically what the, the podcast said was, you just have to start and then whatever you start with, it's gonna look completely different by the end. Do you agree with that knowledge or with, with that, that thought? Or is it something where you knew at the very beginning, we're going this direction, this is what it's gonna look like in the end? I think that it absolutely looks different, you know, but I think the premise, the problem you're solving is is maybe known, right? And then over time, you like how you solve it, the specifics of it change. And and I think that it does, you know, you wake up now and Flywheel does look vastly different from a product perspective. But I think the problem, the core problem, the reason that it's chosen is 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 still the same as it was on day one. Um, but, I, but I do think over time, you know, I remember multiple times through growing Flywheel that we'd have like these moments of like unlock, you know, where yeah. it's like, okay, we understood the customer and like, and then the next day you understood them way better than you did yesterday, just because of like a conversation that's now people are, their ears are breaking up in different ways. And, and I think that that is like, that is the example of, yes, it looks vastly different. Like how do you go to market? It looks different. How you talk about the product looks different. You know, with these specific things the product does looks different, but I think the core premise of the problem and why it's interesting um, remains, you know, and I think that that's true about Flywheel. That's exactly what he said. He said, I, I never fell in love with how we went to market. I never fell in love with how we marketed the product. I fell in love with the problem. Yeah. And if you fall in love with the problem, you have an opportunity to continue wanting to solve it. And it's, you're not just obsessed with, well, we have to sell this widget. Yep. We have to be good at selling this widget instead of just like listening to your yeah. customers and saying, this is what we want to solve. Yeah, I think it's absolutely right. Yeah. And so you guys are very well known for your culture. You were a culture first type company. There's a couple other ones in Nebraska, but as I said, before we started the interview, I have never met a person that has had like something negative to say about their experience working at Flywheel. So you're either paying 
your secret agents a lot of money to, to keep people quiet <laughs> or you're doing an amazing job leading a company and uh, having a great company culture. So talk about culture a little bit for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, at, at some level, I, I think the, the flywheel culture is, is, is sort of derivative of, of my time at Brightmix and the reason why I even started building companies in the first place, which was just to, um, frankly, enjoy going to work and being surrounded by really extraordinary people. And it's, it's kind of like build the culture that you want to be a part of first and foremost. Um, and you know, there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. I mean, we focused on recruiting very early in Flywheel's history and, and you, you, you know, cultures are made up of people. And if you don't, I think often companies under invest in, in how they bring people on board and who they bring on board. Uh, and then, you know, then they, they have cultures that are kind of representative of that. Um, and so we focus on that. I think, you know, Flywheel is a place of great intentionality. We did, we did things with purpose and for reasons, uh, you know, we, I always say like we, we cater lunch to the teams and most people think that that's a perk, right? Like that, that's, that that's like free lunch is a great perk. And, and while it is, uh, you know, I think it's about people coming together around a meal and getting away from their desks. In fact, we, we highly discourage people from taking lunch back to their desk because yeah. that's not the point. The point is actually coming together and people from different departments sitting next to each other and becoming friends and understanding the sort of human on the other side of the table in a way. And I think, you know, those, those types of little things sort of add up over time to, I think, a great, to a, I think to a great culture, frankly. Tony Shea, uh, when he was alive, when he had Zappos in Las Vegas, was famous for uh, for culture, right? Just for, he would go to parties and if the party, like if people weren't interacting in a way that he liked, he was famous for rearranging the furniture mid party and watching people recongregate in the way that he saw it. it <laughs> yeah, super good. <laughs> yeah, and, and like he, he just saw it, right? And then he also was famous for, um, <laughs> he actually took out all the other doors, which is probably a fire hazard in Las Vegas. And he took out all but like two doors. And the one only other, the only other door besides the main entrance was a fire exit because he wanted collisions. Yeah. He wanted people to run in to get to each other on a daily basis, you know, and Hey, saw you last week, you know, you got a thousand employees working out of a building. Like they need to see each other. There's a good chance they work on a different floor. And, um, but I, I love your intentionality around that. And so from a product standpoint, how do you create a, a culture of just like constant winning and we have to be better than we were yesterday? How did you seed that into the team throughout? Good. Well, I think that it, it starts with like, you know, effectively communicating the goal, you know, like, I think like Flywell always, before the podcast, you were asking, you know, like, is this something you guys, you guys were planning to sell in the long term? Like, was this something that you want, wanted to do, or you'd see it in the future? And, and I think that, that no, not in that regard, but like, I think that the company was incredibly focused, right? Um, you know, we, we knew what it meant to win. So if it was uh, in the early days, it was about, you know, talking to as many early customers and prospects just to know, to make, to make sure that the product was like, right like are we on the right path and mm -hmm. then you know that transition to like how do we predictable predictably like get a hundred leads this month right like yeah. what, how do you do that and and that laser focus you know allows the team uh to rally around something and uh, and that evolved over time i mean it was you know over you know every six months it's probably something new um but you kind of over time become this like well-oiled machine of operation you know and i think that um that allows the the company to kind of just know how to win right um and if you and if you can't articulate it i think the other thing we would say a lot over the years is like if and this this comes from someone like tony Shea, right was like if you can't walk across the the floor of your company and ask you know what are you doing today that's helping us shape the goal uh and they can't articulate it then clearly it's on you uh, you didn't you didn't articulate the goal well enough to understand how their work uh, feeds into it and um, so we, we, again, that intentionality that Dusty's talking about is, is, um, is I think how you can allow people to like kind of rally around that like focused goal. I think you also have this, like Flywheel is a place of extraordinary pride, right? Like, and, and not only pride of the company, pride, like, I mean, I like wear I Flywheel t-shirts and most Flywheelers do, uh, but, but pride in the work, right? And pride, you know, pride in the product. And, and pride in the quality of those things. And we, we sort of, I think, empowered people to, to, to do work at a level. We talked a lot about Flywheel often being a place 
uh, where one can do their best work. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, that simple sort of empowerment to do really extraordinary work, the best work of their lives, um, I think creates a, a sense of personal pride, right? like, hey, hey, Ma, look at what I did. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, I think drives people to want to win, right? You yeah. know, and I think that uh, I, th I think my personal opinion is that, that that pride in pride of ownership and pride in one's company is maybe the most most powerful driving force for engagement and for alignment and for ultimately happiness in the workplaces. Maybe for Flywheel too is uh, over the years. I mean, again, you, you wake up three years later and you're like building a company, so it's not like. But there was a point where I think to Dusty's point. You, the company knew what we were doing was special. You know, like this was unique in the area. This is something that like the city can be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked a lot about that, you know, in all hands meetings and stuff. They're like, this is a moment in time that we may never get to relive again together. So let's make the best of it. Let's do our best work. Let's be proud of what we're doing. Um, and that's absolutely the case. I think that's a natural way uh, for people to chase something together, you know, and, and that pride is something that absolutely exudes the company for yeah. sure. Culture is, made up of people, but it's also led by your leadership team. And it's also something that you have to consistently shape and mold and make better over time. Did you ever have a point where you didn't feel like your culture was where, was where it was supposed to be, where you were a little bit worried about it? Did you ever have those moments at all? Or was it always just like peachy keen 24 seven? Oh no, it's like, it's, it, it's constantly evolving, of course. And I think where, where other companies our challenges, and I think in two ways. One is that is that often at the top, there there isn't a focus on it, right? Like it's really easy to have a great culture at twenty people, yeah. Um, but it it gets in like exponentially harder as 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 you scale, and um, and you have to have a focus on it at the top. Otherwise, it's sort of like you don't have. It's not a priority, right? And two, it gets expensive and it takes constant effort and it takes um, constant focus. And it, and it also, this is something I think a lot of people don't think about a lot, which is it, you have to be okay that yesterday is different than today, right? Like, and you have to have people that are okay with that. And in fact, yeah. we, you know, there's many early flywheelers mm -hmm. who, who ultimately left because it wasn't, they weren't okay with the fact that it was different yesterday, right? And that it evolves. And so, um, you know, you just have to be conscious and mindful and intentional about all those things. Uh, and yeah, like, you know, we didn't have, we went a long time as a pretty flat organization, right? We didn't have managers or we didn't have, um, you know, department heads. We didn't have any of this stuff for a long time. Um, and you start putting that in place. And then you're like, oh crap, you wake up and you're like, what does it mean to be a manager at Flywheel, <laughs> yeah. right? And we thought really deeply about that. And we, we invested in those managers and mm -hmm. we did those sorts of things. So like, but while we were investing, you know, there was of course rocky times because, because you had junior managers managing teams for the first time. Well, of, of course they're gonna stumble. And, and as you scale often, like your culture is made of Teams and managers. So like, at that point, I remember like we we didn't we didn't know how to define what it meant to be a manager. So like, how could you expect them to be good at being right. managers? Yeah, you know? and, then, so, and then there's like frustration, but the expectations at times are unclear. Yes, but you're like, but we just need to do it better. But what is that? What does, yeah, that, what mean? does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> and it, and and listen, when the when the company was small and and flat, everybody was one to two degrees away from Rick or I or Tony, right? And right. and and so. You know, I think that we were able to, well, I don't know if we're good managers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but, um, but, but we certainly, I think, are good and strong leaders and, the, and we were close to the people. Well, as you grow and there's more hierarchy, you're further away from people. So actually, you know, it's, you, you, so you're making investments in those, those people in between so that all of the team members um, have an extraordinary experience. It's not enough for me and Rick to be good at that point. Everybody down the, down the line does. I think it's probably one of the bigger lessons we learned as we scaled in terms of culture is scaling management and leadership. And, and we made big, big, big investments into that. To, yeah, I was to try just going to say, the, the, again, back to that word intentionality. In it's like, we, I remember the large investments that we'd make and we'd have a whole year. They were like, oh, we're going to invest in leadership. 
you know, leadership training, like management training, like, and we want to come out the other side with like a definition of what it means to be a leader at Flyo, what it means to mm -hmm. manage people. And, um, and I think that, you know, at our size, I think we were absolutely early on uh, compared to what most companies, how long they go before they start doing like investments in leadership training. And, yeah. and, and I think that those things doing it early on means that you can kind of like weather those storms and your culture feels a little bit better over time. Um, so yeah, I think that it, it definitely was not always peachy keen, mm -hmm. uh, but we were very conscious of where it was breaking. And I think that that is what's important. Yeah. Identifying it and solving the problem early. And candor often like clear as kind uh, as a Brene Brown saying that I, I really like, and you know, just being candorous with people. Uh, were you guys big believers in when somebody was having a, having a tough time in their position going straight to like a performance improvement plan? Or was it something where you would just basically like, look, it's just, it's just not working out the way it's supposed to. Were you a little bit quicker on that or a little bit slower? Just kind of curious from a culture well, standpoint. I think two things. One is that I agree on candor. In fact, a, an area that we were pushing, I mean, as we were scaling towards the end, um, like, I think the candor was probably the number one, like, like positive direct feedback, positive and negative direct feedback, I mm -hmm. think um, w was was probably the biggest area of growth that we were focused on. So I agree with that 100%. Um, as far as, you know, quick to act or not, um, I would say that Flywheel was a place that um, almost naturally expelled people who didn't want to do extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was less, and some of that was proactive, right? Whether it's performance improvement or otherwise. And some of it was just people tapped out because they, because, you know, and, and so you, you, you didn't have to deal with that, I think, as much at, at Flywheel as, 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 as maybe in other places that we've been. But um, so I don't know if we were, were quick to act or not. I, I personally believe in second and third chances, right? Like mm -hmm. we took chances on lots and lots of people. And, 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 and some people who had, um, you know, either performance issues or other, other reasons, we would often give second and third chances too, and it worked out extraordinarily. And, and so it was kind of a little mix of both, but, um, you know, we, as an organization, a very low tolerance or zero tolerance for, um, you know, we had a value of like, be excellent to each other. And that one I think was probably the one we took the most serious, we had, like mm -hmm. zero tolerance for people who weren't just like, excellent to each other. Yeah. Right. So. And backing up a little bit here, why flywheel? Why the name? Oh, <laughs> completely threw that at you. Left why flywheel? flywheel? <laughs> why? Uh, <laughs> it's been 10 years now and we don't have a good story. So. I was hoping by now we'd have like this, yeah, this great, like, I'm hoping you know, you two pair it together. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> Joshua tree situation. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah. So the, the actual story is that we had a different name picked out. So Dusty mentioned like the the humanizing this hosting kind of industry. So yeah, like when we launched Flywheel, we were probably the only hosting company that had people on their website. And like for us, we looked at <laughs> yeah, you are. we looked at like the fact that you know what hosting actually does is empower people to like create, right? Like you can put things online. And it's really about the people and the stories, and that that's what we wanted to talk about. And um, so we had this a different brand picked out that was kind of like almost the antithesis of technical. Uh, and we were excited about it. And what and was the name? Do you remember again, the name? I, it, It's terrible. It was <laughs> it was Orchard, uh, which was you kind of this idea around like you know symbolic of uh, the organic approach they wanted to to build in the hosting industry. Well, there's legal issues with kind of like different uh, companies in the space using the name. So um, at this point, we had customers and um, we still wanted something that stood out. And I, I literally remember just reading a blog post of some sort one night. And I needed to pick a name out and there was this word flywheel and I was like, that's, that's pretty interesting. Like, it has this like kind of creative uh, take. It, it actually is symbolic, I think, of a creative word, but it powers, uh, you know, engines, you know, so it, it felt right. And, and that was the name that we landed on. So that, that is the story. There's no like amazing. <laughs> it's just a right. It, it, yeah, it, it, it felt right. It felt right. And, yeah. and I think that it, it, you know, it was, <laughs> I love it. It's, it's like, I would say mechanical yet whimsical, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and Flywheel, if you know it and you, you spend any time here and you, uh, and you interact with the brand, you know that it's just like, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And yep. I think that uh, it just kind of stuck, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think I remember asking Paul Jarrett at Bulu about that. And I just asked him, 
I just like, so what, what's the, what's the deep meaning? Yeah, I want to know about this. Cause I've always wondered. He's like, absolutely nothing. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I really love, I don't feel that bad. I, I, like, I, <laughs> he's like, I really love Tulu. I threw a dart. We wanted something else. <laughs> I, love <Tulu. laughs> I love Tulu. We wanted something else. Like no, he's, he's great. If you guys haven't had a chance to, to meet him, but yeah, but that's, yeah, we know Paul well. Yeah. I just, no, I just, just wanted to call it that. But I mean, that, that and now looking, kind of half but like, yeah. And you know, Google didn't mean anything. Yahoo didn't mean anything. All the, all these huge companies. So I, I think that's, I think that's really funny how sometimes that works. And then they the, just take The thing off. that we didn't want to be was something hosting, which, you know, half the companies. WordPress space, managed hosting host systems and this. services. Yeah, host, host that. Host Gator. X, you know, yeah. Those yeah. are pretty yeah. common names at <laughs> like, the time. And that was the antithesis again on the branding element. So we knew that that wasn't right. the case. Other than that, there was really no no reason for it. Yeah. yeah, and those people did not have human beings on their website. No, they, they, did, they did not. They did not. <laughs> but I, I like that approach though, because I then I, I love what you said about empowering creatives at the end of the day. Because really it's just like this is like a core fear that you've got they've got over here, which is like, I really hope this beautiful thing that I built doesn't go die yeah. <laughs> or that something happens yeah. to it and you know, if, you know, affects my reputation because yeah. I, I do care about that end product and I want someone to care about the hosting like I care about the end product. Just like you said at the beginning, we're building twenty thousand dollar websites on a five dollar per month hosting plan. Like something's <laughs> wrong here. So it's, I that I, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that doesn't that doesn't quite compute. Yeah. So you had you had a phenomenal um, run with Flywheel, and it's just this this growing, crazy, fast growing company. What was kind of the moment where you guys where you guys kind of like looked around? And you're like, kind of made it. Like this is this is a pretty big deal. Like, when, how many years in was that? I think that for me, the the the, the moment that stands out to me is at our five five year anniversary. At, we had your fifth birthday. Um, we, you know, Flywheel had about a third of our team was remote uh, all around the world, and four times a year, we'd fly everybody in and do a big all company sort of retreat. And, and then we'd get people together for, for dinner and the whole thing. And so, uh, that happened to coincide with our, one of those happened to coincide with our fifth birthday. And here we are sort of, um, probably a hundred people or so at that time, uh, all at one big long table for a dinner. And, you know, most companies don't make it five years, frankly. Uh, and don't, and here we are five years in, there's a hundred people here and they're all together sharing a meal and celebrating and they're laughing. And, and you just kind of like, I remember like Rick and Tony and I are sitting like in the middle of this big long table, of course. And, and you just kind of like looking around going like, holy shit, like, <laughs> When did this happen? <laughs> like, like, like. For me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about revenue, right? It's like, oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I do remember that day. There's another thing that we kind of followed along with. So uh, Jason Lemkin is uh, an amazing venture capitalist, runs this, this VC firm called Saster, sold his company to Adobe. But um, we've always looked up to him as... I mean, he has like, he's like one of the most prolific Quora. You know, I think he's like basically made Quora a thing. Originally, his, his answers are amazing on just the depth of like investments and startups mm -hmm. and mostly SaaS businesses. And, um, and one of the things that kind of went viral was his idea around like when, when has a company succeeded in SaaS or recurring revenue business in general? And he had this thing that just said like $1 million, you've done the impossible. If you do a million dollars a year, you've literally done the impossible. If you get to $10 million in annual recurring revenue, you will never die. You know, and I and I remember from the wow. early days of Flywheel thinking there's no way we're ever going to get to ten million dollars a year, and I distinctly remember the day that we did. Um, and of course, the company celebrated, and 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 I, I I flashed to that tweet that he had where I was like, maybe maybe we won't die. And up until this <laughs> point, you know, like every day is just oh, you think you're dying every you're day, just falling <laughs> off the rails. You're like worried right. about money, and like you know. And so I remember that uh, being a moment where I was like, okay, this this company will outlive me, you know? And I think that's kind of interesting. So, cool. so that's really special. I love that. Like the legacy aspect of it. When you guys were, when you guys were growing and, um, you've, you've got this great revenue coming in, you've got a hundred employees. How did you steer clear of shiny object syndrome? Like chasing the next thing. Cause you have money. There's Where money did in you this. get that phrase? Cause I love it. We use that all the time. Is that like a I always thought it was like invented at Flywheel. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, like, um, just stole it from. I have no idea. Stole it from Landon. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <it means. laughs> you watch my podcast. <laughs> but, but, but you say it, yeah. and we talk about it all the time. So like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But I'm just, I'm just curious. How did you, you know, when it's, it's one thing when like you're scrounging at the beginning and you're like, okay, we have to make money and we have to try these different things. But then you get like your product where you want your product, or you see like the trajectory trajectory of where your product can go. But then money comes in the system. 
you've, you've, you're taking care of the people in terms of overhead and everything. And then you've got a little bit of excess cash. How did you avoid like going down these different rabbit holes and, you know, stay focused on the mission? I don't know. I think we were always, um, I was, I was always real scrappy just in general, uh, right? And there were many, many years where we didn't have any money. And so, you know, we weren't able to raise venture capital or we weren't growing as quickly as we, we, we'd hoped or whatever the case might be. And so you sort of built a muscle and a, a, around, um, around being scrappy. And, and part of being scrappy is, is not being distracted. Like part of, part of being good at that and, 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 and persevering in that way, I think is not sort of like veering too far off. Um, and I think that even then when we went on to raise more money and you did have more cash, I think that the DNA of, of, of flywheelers was sort of like rooted in that, I think in a lot of, in a lot of senses. And so, um, I think that's probably the, from my perspective, the number one, um, but there's a fine line. Like I, I always say, there's a fine line between an opportunity and a distraction, right? And mm. it's 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 razor thin because that same thing. Like we ended up buying a a little company, uh, you know, m many years ago uh, that that we were buying a product um, that we could sort of add to our portfolio uh, and 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 provide to our customers, and uh, which turned out, I think, to be the best one of the best things that we ever did. Um, and, and, but we didn't like, it could have been a distraction. Right. And so, you know, I think that that was, that was, I think over the years, I think the scrappiness helped, but also just like recognizing that line and making sure that we weren't always asking a question, like, is something a distraction? And I think the fly will also, we, you know, when you, when you do have access to resources, those like capital is like, you know, smarter people, like you, you have a lot of opportunities. You mean you just, you just yeah. do, and um, I think the one thing that we would do also is understand like, is is the company's growth, is it is it really ours to chase right still, or is there some other like market thing that's happening that's slowing down growth, or is it just we should do this more? You know, mm -hmm. we should be better at this thing, and we should get better at it every day. And I think that like that was always clear that we were in a market that really our kind of success was about us operating you know it's like we just we need to attack this problem the problem is there the market's growing um we don't need to go do this other thing like, we just do need to you do, do this international better. sales no well, no you don't because yeah. they're like we haven't quite yes sold everyone in the u.s yet. yeah like, there's like a so, lot like, of things like to a sell. lot of people right. here <laughs> you know so i think that, like there was a lot of conversations around those types of things which was like yeah like should we open an international office and do sales well, no, maybe we should get better at the fact that we're still converting at this percent. You know, we can improve that by just a half percent and it changes the company dramatically. <laughs> you know, so, um, but yeah, I think that it's a it's a challenge. And I think a lot of it actually, to Dusty's point, happens in the product conversations, which is like, should we chase this product? And, you know, the company that we did buy, you know, slotted into our strategy so well. And it was something that honestly, in the early days of Philo was, one of the things we wanted to build and we felt like the market needed and it was so clear to us, you know, so it wasn't risky and it actually did kind of like catapult the company, yeah. I think, from a so brand perspective. What was it? So it's uh, in, I mean, you're in the space, you're, you know, web designer, and, uh, but um, so in the hosting space, you're, you're building online and of course, in reality, software developers are building on their local machines and they have their local environments because it's faster and just more efficient to do that. Um, and the question always is like, how do you get that local thing online, mm -hmm. right? In an yep. easy way. And we wanted to solve that problem because as a, a web developer, it's, it's, it's hard. You want that thing that looks great on your computer to look exactly like that when you get online and rarely is the environment the same. Um, so we bought a uh, great product that, that built that local WordPress server. Uh, and then we connected it to our hosting environment. So you can kind of one click deploy to Flywheel, which I think was a, like I said, a big unlock. And it kind of like solved that, um, you know, first step of getting a site online, which a lot of our customers had a challenge with. Yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge opportunity to, again, make that just reduce the friction to yep. get it online and, uh, and to get it there. So when, when you guys, you, you guys are growing this thing, like you said, 100 employees hit 10 million in rev. Um, what were the different schedules you guys were raising raising funds? That, did you raise really early or like, did it happen later? How did that work for you? Um, so we raised a really, so the sort of history of flywheel financing, we raised a, a, a small friends and family round early on, which just kind of allowed us all to focus full time. I think that was uh, in 2000 and 
uh, 13. Uh, in 2014, raised a seed round. 2016, raised our Series A. In 2018, raised our Series B. Um, and so uh, kind of on a schedule of every two years, as it turned out, um, just kind of doubling down. And we were always, I don't think we ever needed money, really. Um, it was always about growth and about, you know, uh, further capitalizing on the opportunity. And so, um, yeah, we and had an opportunity to work with some great investment partners over the years. And so, yeah, yeah. And, and you after you raise all that money, you have all these opportunities. I'm sure the I'm sure the friends and family are really happy at this point. Um, it, it clearly worked out for them. And um, you guys had a really big kind of, again, sparked fire moment where you guys actually ended up uh, selling. So talk about talk about the day that that happened. Talk about like the lead up to that. I just want to know the full story there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy because it's it's always the intent, right? Flywheel was built to sell. Uh, that was the point in a way, um, but never having gone through it at that scale, it's certainly a crazy uh, both moment. And I always describe it as it's made up of many. I guess sparks or moments, right? Mm -hmm. There's the the moment we first got the uh, the email from WP Engine, and you know <laughs> I remember where we were, and I was like, I was like, holy shit, check this out. And then that's interesting. That's okay. interesting. And then <laughs> yeah, right. Was, okay, yeah. Be, be honest. What what actually what actually happened at but that? The point? problem is over the years you get you get a lot of a lot of emails. You get a lot yeah. of those types of emails, yeah. uh, and so you 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 learn to not get your hopes up, and you learn to not. Um, um, and we weren't for sale, like we weren't, it was not our intent to sell. It just happened to come out of the blue. And I think it happened to be a good uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but there's that moment, there's a moment in which you, um, like you uh, decide, like you come to an agreement on the, f like, like frankly on the price and, and you're like, that's a moment. And that kicks off the entire then like process. And then there's the point at which, you know, you get the documents are all done and you're done and it's closed. There's a point where you tell the teams and there's a big celebration. We put a lot of work and effort into doing that with great, I think, intentionality. And then, you know, there's a point where, frankly, there's a point where the money hits a bank. I mean, there's like, there's, there's, there's all these things. And, and for, for Flywheel, it, it went quick. I mean, that was like kind of uncharacteristically quick uh, about, 60 days, maybe 70 wow. days um, from contact to close. And so, um, um, which is great because it's a distraction. We'd been through that process before and it didn't work out and you end up just wasting time. And so. Yeah, and to uh, only spend 60 days on a successful transaction and works so, out really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, it was crazy, it was wild. I think it's one of the, uh, uh, it's certainly one of the high, the high points of my, my career it was that, so it was 60 days. Um, but you know, I, I think it was a great, a great outcome for, for, for our partners, our investors, a great outcome for our teams. Like I think they're in really good hands and, and frankly, good outcomes for our customers. Um, because with WP engine flywheel, uh, I think is a great sort of complementary uh, set of, uh, products and, and organization. And it, I think at the end of the day creates a ton of value in the market and humanizes WP. And to to a further extent, I mean, when you talk about having a humanizing company around hosting, I mean, that's a huge opportunity for them as well. Yeah, I so. think so. I think that you know, WP Engine served a a, a much more uh, sort of enterprisey customer base, and mm -hmm. Flywheel served a, a more creative customer base. And you know, together you can you can kind of learn from each other and how to how to approach those things um, from a different perspective. And so, yeah, we and we spent the last year and a half at WP Engine, um, you know, working with those teams and and kind of bringing things together and, uh, you know, you know, frankly, setting setting both our teams and our customers up for 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 I success. Think also, like back to the question that you asked about like distractions, right? You know, as we grew in the WordPress space and WP Engine was going through the same experience at a different scale, where like you are one of three brands in WordPress hosting, so you have customers of all types kind of finding your door, you know, and, and that was another thing that was great about the acquisition was that it allowed, you know, WP Engine to focus on what they were great at, you know, which was kind of up market, you know, and, and, and in some ways like consumer level, like hosting, right? I need a WordPress site online. Like I can, I can go to WPEngine.com and get that. Flywheel can stop worrying about, you know, selling to enterprise brands and trying to represent something that, mm -hmm. you know, we frankly, we don't have the DNA for, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that, that melding I think was great too. And, and it's kind of fun to see Flywheel at WP Engine now because 
it's one of the biggest brands in WordPress. You know, I think that it's still going to continue to impact that industry that we made kind of this fingerprint on, you know? Uh, so I like, I like where Flywheel lives today. It's going to, it feels right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you, you're not done. You're very young dudes. You were successful early. Um, a lot of people don't, don't reach this level of success. Like you said, most companies die um, before they have five years. You guys have been doing this for a while now and I have, I'm sure you have no intention of stopping. So what's next for Dusty and Rick? Well, you know, we, Rick and I worked together a long time. Uh, I think we complement each other really well. And, and in a lot of ways, yeah, we're young and, you know, it's like, uh, but, but one of the things I, I find fascinating about certainly my career as an entrepreneur is that you, you, you know, first company, you're just young and dumb. And the next one, you're like less young, less dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and and it just keeps going in that direction, yeah. but um, never smart, just less dumb, less dumb, just less dumb, yeah, and, yeah. and always right. older. Um, <laughs> and and in a way, we've you know we we learned. I mean, it was like you like learned so much as yeah. through the, the on, on how to scale companies, how to scale cultures, how to scale teams, um, and how to build great products. Uh, and I think that uh, you know we we talk often about like we'd be we'd be we'd be dumb not to not to do it again. <laughs> because you you also have met extraordinary people, and I think that's the um, you know and you know being able to to work with with great people is uh, I think in many ways what it's all about. And so uh, you know we're um, from what two two months in. Yeah, you know, we're two months into a uh, to our next venture uh, workshop, uh, really thinking about solving a problem that we experienced at Flywheel as we scaled, which is how do you. Um, how do you how do you effectively communicate the most important pieces of information to the team to create alignment uh, and ultimately engagement of the teams and performance? Um, right, the the stuff that you know Slack's great, it is uh, really noisy, uh, and if you go on vacation, you're screwed and you miss out <laughs> on a lot of really important stuff. Um, you know how do you, how do you how do you create a set of tools that allow you to communicate really important bits of information to your teams, um, whether that's, you know, OKRs or um, all hands updates or product announcements internally, um, and then have a place for that to live. So kind of a, a company hub and in internal communication tool uh, called Workshop. And so uh, excited, excited to sort of be back at the early stage uh, and just kind of grinding away. Yeah. Do you, so will you guys keep your same style of positions, whereas you're more into product, you're planning to be the chief executive officer of this one as well? Is that kind of the idea? It worked once, try it again, is that type of thing? Run it back, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah run yeah. it back. <laughs> I, think, I think like Dusty said, it's a, it's a complimentary kind of skill set between him and I. And yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy being on the calls of customers, building the products, you know, and I think that, that Dusty focused as well on scaling culture, building great teams. And that, mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely like how we're looking at this, this company too. And you love the subscription revenue, Absolutely. Uh, like the, the SaaS model, um, subscription revenue, MRR. Would you recommend that every company tries to find a way to uh, build that in uh, to what they do? It's funny. It, it, yes. I think, I think they're like, it's funny that you say that because at Flywheel, like we go to these agencies and we're like, what are you guys doing? You should probably be doing recurring revenue of some sort. Like of some sort. Yeah. yeah. Of some sort. Like you should, you should be able to weather the storm a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I think that, that the great thing about SaaS businesses is that over time, like if you get better and the market's there, like uh, you grow and you're sustainable, you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we certainly love that type of business and workshop will operate in a similar way, but and it's what we know. I mean, that's yeah. that's the other thing. It's kind of just levering up on what we already know. So, yeah. I mean, there's lots of ways to make money in the world. And um, we just happen to, I think, uh, know how to do it in SaaS effectively, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you learn a lot about, about that even through Flywheel. Like Flywheel wasn't true, like software as a service. Um, it, it was recurring revenue, which is good, but it also, you know, we had, a, we had you know, tens of thousands of servers right, that we had to pay for every day. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, this kind of stuff that you're like, um, you know, as we think about the next one, you know, that uh, we are decidedly not in the hosting world. Like we are, um, you know, you, you kind of learn a lot about recurring revenue, but you also learn about, you know, how do you want to build something that um, is more efficient from a, like more capital efficient or, or whatever the case might be, but you know, it's yeah. just what we know. Yeah. 
Yeah, very well. And is that something where you guys, again, built to sell same, same idea where, or is this something that's going to, you just want to do for, for the rest of the time? I mean, just kind of like rinse, repeat on, on your, your current process. You know, at Flywheel, it's kind of funny. Yes, we did build the company to sell, right? Because you, you took venture money. So, you know, you got to get, got to get the capital out of it somehow. But, um, but we always said like, at the end of the day, like, let's build a great company. Like, let's yeah. build a great product. Let's, let's, let's have great customers. Let's build a place where people want to work, you know, these types of things and like good things happen. And I think workshops will be, you know, through that same lens, which is like, let's focus on figuring out the right problem to solve and solving it in the right way and building a great company. And hopefully then, you know, things go well and, and, and maybe someday you sell the company, but, uh, you definitely like, I, I don't think, I don't think I should recommend to anyone like go into a business trying to sell it. I think that's the wrong um, the wrong reason to start a company, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it is more just a nuance of, of taking on investment means that you have to create an yeah. outcome for them at some point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, built to sell is probably a flippant way to say it, but, um, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, it's like, <laughs> right. But, day, but just like, having the investors in mind, right. I mean, it's, it's, exactly. it's not unethical by any means. It's just a matter of like, this is the style of business. Well, yep. and we, yep. and, and we were always, and we always had good fortune of being super aligned with our investors in terms of what what was the goal, right? And um, and we're, we were all building to build a great company. And mm-hmm. I think workshop will be exactly the same. And I think that um, you know we've got uh, uh, you know an ability, um, I think, to 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 do that in a really in a really cool way. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs that want to get started and uh, create a company that you know just lives online? Oh man, um, well I've I, I'll give my answer. I, 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 yeah, I've had the good fortune of of working with um, I've had a number of companies over the years and, and started a bunch and, and 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 with different partners each time actually, um, and I think that my number one piece of advice to to to, to people looking to start is like I believe in having co-founders. Like, Interesting. It's lonely yeah. at the top, as I say, mm-hmm. and um, and you want to to be, I think, sort of in the foxhole with people that are aligned in the same way mm-hmm. um, and that can complement you in, uh, in both skill sets and in, in sort of, you know, uh, how, you, how you think about the world. Um, and so I believe strongly in that. And I also believe that like getting that right is, is like the most important thing because if you start day one with somebody who you don't want to actually work with, then it's not ever going to happen. And I think that, um, it's too hard, you know, it's it's too difficult. Yeah. And you want to make sure you're value aligned and you want to make sure that you're outcome aligned and you want to make sure that you're, um, you know, all these sorts of things. And, and, and oftentimes the only way to do that is to work with people. Rick and Tony and I worked together for many years before Mm -hmm. starting a company together. Um, and workshop and our new partners are the same way workshop and our new partners that yeah. we have two other partners at workshop and they, um, they were early flywheel employees and they, mm. um, we, we worked with them for many years. And so, uh, you know, I think that that's, so to me, the number one piece of advice is, is like, like you got to get, you got to get that relationship right out of the gate. Otherwise you're, yeah. you're, I think you're, you're in a tough spot. And, and you said it, it's too hard to yeah. not have someone to, to lean on. And I think my answer is similar, at least solving for the same problem. They're like, hey, it's too hard. And, and my advice is just find find the problem you're passionate about, yeah. you know, because if you're, if you're chasing, to your point, if you're chasing, you know, money and you're chasing the idea of selling a company someday, like mm-hmm. it's not gonna work out. But because at Flywheel, I, I remember in the early days, we tell these stories to our early employees, you know, um, we'd be up in the middle of the night answering customer calls. I mean, you're mm-hmm. a hosting company, you know, I mean, I mean, for the first about three or four years, we were on rotation between Dusty, Tony and I, uh, to do overnight support, you know, three nights in a row, probably a dozen calls, you know, every three days. It was insane. My wife would make me I forgot sleep. about that. Yeah. I'd sleep <laughs> I on my couch, put that out of my mind. you know, and I had this buzzer to wake me up, you know? So like in, in the reality is if, if I didn't care deeply about the problem we were solving, the customers that we were working with, like I, I'm not, answering the call, you know? No. And I think that it's all, it's going to get hard at some point. And if you really, really care about it, you'll get up in the morning on the hardest day and get back to work. And, yeah. and if you don't, uh, I think that you'll that's give up. that yeah, you'll give up. So I think it's, yeah. it's finding something you're incredibly passionate about is, is probably my advice. 
That's a, that's a, that's a really good way of saying that. Uh, just kind of fin up, finishing up with some more rapid fire questions uh, as, as we, we end this here. You mentioned OKRs. You an OKR traction. What what do you guys prefer as far as far as like your business operations uh, inside of your companies? Yeah, that that changed over the time. Of course, as we as we scaled, I think that um, you know we 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 ended up with the OKR process, and I think that worked well. Like we we, we was, but it evolved in, in in took many iterations, right? I think the the end goal is like how and Rick mentioned this earlier. Like how does everybody on the team know? how what they're doing contributes to um, both the mission of what you're trying to accomplish long term, but mm -hmm. also, um, you know, the goals and what you're trying to accomplish in the near term. And so uh, you know, we ran a, an OKR process and we uh, we were a retrospective uh, culture, right? We looked back on performance and looked at the things that we did well and things we did bad. And that was in products and in uh, sales and in marketing and across and on our people team, like across the board. Um, and so, you know, we kind of picked, uh, you know, bits and pieces from lots of different strategies, uh, on how to, how to create alignment and cadence in the business. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, I've heard a lot of people say that exact same thing. They like pieces here. They'll pull from that. Um, I want I want you to e each answer, answer this question. So what are two books that change your life and whoever has them on deck, you, the person can go first. I like the, the the two that stand out most in my time at Flyo. I read Shoe Dog, which yeah. of course is Phil Knight, Phil Knight. Um, and I think that's a story of perseverance, perseverance, and an entrepreneur. You know, it's just passionate about the problem over many years. And I mean, how many times you know Nike almost failed was, I mean, it's, it's amazing to read that book. Also, being the stories are just amazing. So yeah. I'd recommend that book. And the other thing is growing flywheel it was a sales acceleration formula which is uh, a book by mark roberge which is um, one of the old uh, sales leaders at hubspot which i'm a huge fan of hubspot um a fanboy of to be frank like i love the company <laughs> incredible culture incredible product um but that book is frankly the playbook that i think we used in a lot of ways to scale growth um so, you know, every sales leader that we'd bring through the door, I'd be like, you have to read this book. It will make more sense about what we're doing here. Yeah. You know, uh, so those are two things. And I think one's very much like the story of entrepreneurship. And the other one for me was like very operational about how do you just take, you know, what you're doing today and improve it a little bit tomorrow. And um, those those two books shaped me. You know? I love it. I'm sure you have many more than that. Yeah. I, you mentioned Tony Shea earlier. You know, I I. I it was a good fortune of getting to know Tony uh, oh. years ago as uh, as as part of uh, the Big Omaha journey. He, he spoke at Big Omaha and um, he was in Omaha a number of times. And uh, we flew the entire company out to Las Vegas to to tour Zappos and so go on through that yeah. whole thing. Uh, and so yeah, Tony's Tony's book. In fact, Tony launched his book, Delivering Happiness, at Big Omaha. And really? yeah, gave everybody in the audience a free copy. And so, you know, like there's so many connection points there. And I think he, like the, that model of, of service, I think, um, and culture, right? This idea uh, around those ideas around that, I think, shaped, shaped Flywheel in, in, in so many ways. And me personally, right? And he was just, as, as you had talked about, it, an extraordinary human. Yeah. Um, and similarly, with regards to service, I, 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 a book that stands out to me is um, it's called Setting the Table by this guy, Danny Meyer. And Danny is a, a, a restaurateur in New York. Mm -hmm. he, he started some of the top restaurants in New York and uh, Shake Shack is, is, is he started uh, as well. Yes. And yeah. so he's been very successful, but he he like his theories around um, hospitality right, and how how you hire people with high hospitality quotients. Yes. Like this idea that like there are people who want to serve and want to treat other people well. Um, also shaped Flywheel in a lot of ways, right? Flywheel is uh, a hugely service oriented business. Didn't, and didn't he hire people specifically like Midwestern values? Like, wasn't that like a really big highlight for him? Yeah. In that? Yeah, absolutely. Which is great because obviously we're in the center of that. Here, yeah, yeah. here we are, right? Yeah. Good for us, right? <laughs> it's good for us. It's a little easier for us. <laughs> oh yeah, we've got that, yeah, right? Yeah. But I, I remember going to Shake Shack when I was when I was uh, I think it was in New York and just being like, this place is awesome. But then I read about it afterwards when I left and just how awesome the experience was. So yeah, and I love really good I one. love those types of things that are that are seemingly incongruent with tech businesses, right? Like it's a restaurant, like what do you, does it matter? And you're like, I mean, that's why Shoe Dog's awesome. Like mm -hmm. it's, 
it's, it's sort shoes. of like all these <laughs> yeah. all these stories i think kind of you know you can you can borrow bits and pieces from people who have done it in other places and and then bring that to your experience at at flywheel or in a tech company and i think make make super big impact so yeah those are my my two very good okay parting pieces of advice is for any entrepreneur and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up honestly i think they're like the, the hardest part is starting. So you just gotta like, you just gotta start because you're not gonna learn anything. Also, don't be afraid to share what you're working on with a customer or a prospect because you also aren't gonna learn, you know, and it's hard to hard to do it the first time because you're you're like embarrassed by the lack of quality. Right. And and you just need to learn, you know, so just get stuff out and, and talk to customers. So I always, the, the advice I always give is uh, this. So Jerry Seinfeld is, uh, somebody asked Jerry Seinfeld, like, how, how, do, you, how do we become a, a great comedian? And he's like, it's easy. You just get one of these calendars um, <laughs> and a red marker. And he goes, and, do ev- it every day? and every day you write a joke. <laughs> exactly. And then you make a red X in the thing. Yeah. And then you do that for three months. And a red X, every day you write a joke. And he goes, he goes, I don't know if you'll be funny or not, but at the end of three months, you'll be, you'll know more on whether or not you can be a comedian, right? I think my advice to, to startup founders is, is, is that, right? It's too often we talk to early founders who come and they're like, you know, we're like, well, how many customers have you called this week or potential customers or whatever the case might be? It's like, well, you know, you know, this, that, the other. And it's like, stop it. Like it's the number. Just like every day call customers. And I guarantee you in three months, you will know whether or not your product's any good. You'll know this and that and the other. And so um, that hustle in the early days of Flywheel, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget that, right? It's like Tony's writing code and uh, and Rick yeah. and I can both write code, but not very good. And so- <laughs> We um, stopped that early on. We stopped that early on. <laughs> Tony's like, you guys go call customers. And yeah, so, sure um, you know, that's it for me. Just the hustle. Like I think too, too, oftentimes people don't do the work and yeah. um, and it's like, it's, it's tough work. And, yeah. uh, but- it's doable. I mean, if if a couple of yeah. public school kids from the Midwest can can <laughs> can build flywheel, That's I think right. that uh, <laughs> your prospects are strong. Yeah, you're gonna be fine. Oh, you're looking up to me. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's awesome. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, this has been this has been such a blessing to have you guys in here. And this is the uh, this is the Ashton building. Uh, that we're actually filming in today. So a lot of times, obviously, people that are going to watch and listen to this, uh, you know, we we film at Grindstone uh, in Lincoln, but we have this beautiful space that you guys are uh, going to be. Uh, the flywheel is actually on the second and fourth floor. You said, yeah. So Ashen Building Flywheel is the anchor tenant here and in this district called Millwork Commons uh, mm-hmm. in the north part of downtown Omaha. Um, c- kind of really anchoring the redevelopment of this kind of creative tech corridor uh, in a cool way. And so Flywheel occupies the third and the fourth floors of this building. Uh, you know, it, it opened in, you know, June of last year, mid pandemic, yeah. um, not even mid, early pandemic, I guess at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, so when things open back up, uh, you know, Flywheel teams will come back uh, and be here and this kind of fill this space in, in kind of a really cool way. And, uh, you know, workshop is excited to, to be here in a part of this district as well as we grow and scale. Oh. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think a lot about and we, flywheel and we think a lot about, you know, how can we be a part of a community of, of creative technologists and, you know, create collisions <laughs> at a, when we can collide again, you know, this whole thing. <laughs> and, right. But, you know, I, I, I'm super passionate about that. And that's why, you know, in a lot of ways, why flywheel is here and, it's just a beautiful space too. I think we've got a, uh, I think a special place in our hearts for old, like creative, you know, brick, cool buildings. File for, you know, seven years was was headquartered in the old market and yeah. kind of similar similar place. So, um, we're excited for this uh, this whole this whole area to come come back to life. You know. Yeah, I and when I when I envision the future of Grindstone, by the way, this is exactly what I imagine it looking like: giant wood beams, steel beams, everything, um, accent lighting, wood floors. Like, so this is a really cool like vision moment for me, and, yeah, uh, and I want to get yeah. it documented um, and on video because I, I I definitely see us uh, working in a space like this, and um, look forward to uh, joining you guys here someday, maybe. 
That's awesome, Looking man. Looking forward to it. All right, guys. Uh, hope that was a big note-taking episode for everybody. I know I learned a ton about culture, um, about growing a great company, and uh, just more about these two awesome guys. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was thank great. You. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, make sure you uh, take a screenshot of this and share this to your Instagram story um, and tag Flywheel, tag Dusty, tag Rick. Um, you guys want to like list out your handles. What, what's your guys' handles on social media, you, on Instagram, I'm sure? Uh, Dusty D on Instagram and on Twitter. Rick Knutson on Instagram and Twitter. And Perfect. I won't spell it. Yeah, it's fine. Just just guess. He's yeah, probably just got so many followers. You'll find it. It'll, it'll go to the top, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, make sure you tag Spark to Fire and these guys and Flywheel uh, so we can get a lot more visibility on the show. And if you enjoyed this, please leave a five-star rating and a written review. That's how we get more awesome people like these guys on the show. Thanks.